The views and opinions expressed on Reasonably Speaking are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of the American Law Institute or the speakers' organizations. The content presented in this broadcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal advice. Please be advised that episodes of Reasonably Speaking explore complex and often sensitive legal topics and may contain mature content. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the American Law Institute's podcast, Reasonably Speaking. Have you ever wondered what goes into completing an ALI project? In this episode, our reporter-exclusive panel discusses how they came to be ALI reporters, as well as their journey from project conception to ALI membership approval and completion. Our first panelist is Matthew Fletcher. Matthew serves as a reporter on Restatement of the Law, the Law of American Indians. He is Foundation Professor of Law at Michigan State University College of Law, where he serves as the Director of the Indigenous Law and Policy Center. He sits as the Chief Justice of the Porch Band of Creek Indian Supreme Court and also sits as an appellate judge for nine other bands and tribes. He is also a member of the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. Our second panelist is Jeffrey Miller. Jeff serves as a reporter on principles of the law, compliance and enforcement for organizations. He is the Stuyvesant P. Comfort Professor of Law at New York University School of Law founder and director of NYU School of Law's Center for Financial Institutions, and co-director of the Center for Civil Justice. He is also founder of the Society for Empirical Legal Studies, a scholarly organization devoted to promoting statistical and other empirical techniques in the study of legal institutions. Our third panelist is Dr. Christiane Windehorse. Christiane serves as co-reporter for Principles for a Data Economy a project conducted jointly with the ALI and the European Law Institute. She is the professor of civil law at the University of Vienna and founding member and president of the ELI. She is also chair of the civil law section of the Austrian Juris Forum, co-chair of the German Data Ethics Committee, and member of the Academy Europea, the International Academy for Comparative Law, and the Bioethics Committee at the Austrian Federal Chancellery. Our fourth panelist is Ken Simons. Ken serves as chief reporter for Restatement Third of Torts, Intentional Torts to Persons. Ken is a leading scholar of tort law, criminal law, and philosophy. He is Chancellor's Professor of Law and Philosophy at UC Irvine School of Law and co-director of UCI's Center for Legal Philosophy. In January 2019, he was named the recipient of the 2019 William L. Prosser Award by the Association of American Law Schools Section on Torts and Compensation Systems, which recognizes outstanding contributions of law teachers in scholarship, teaching, and service related to tort law and compensation systems. Today's panel is moderated by Larissa Litsky. Larissa, a prominent media law scholar, serves as co-reporter on Restatement of the Law Third, Torts, defamation, and privacy. She is Dean of the University of Missouri School of Law and Judge C.A. Leedy Professor of Law. Missouri Lawyers Media named her its 2020 Woman of the Year based on her scholarship, passion for law, mentorship of students, and engagements of constituencies supporting the School of Law. Her work on anonymous speech has been cited by a number of state Supreme Courts and the highest courts of Canada and Hong Kong. I will now turn the microphone over to Dean Litsky. Thank you. I'm Larissa Litsky, and I'm very honored to be here today with these distinguished ALI reporters. I'm a relatively new co-reporter on the Restatement of Defamation, and so I'm eager to learn from their wisdom. Uh, We're going to start with asking each of the panelists to give a brief overview of their project. Uh, I'm going to start with Jeffrey Miller of NYU. Jeffrey, can you tell us about your project? So uh, our project is a principles project, which is a little bit different than the restatement projects in that it more or less uh, aims to provide guidelines for best practices rather than summaries of what the law is. And it's also not entirely about law. It's about practices that relate to law but aren't always legally. Uh, my co-reporters are Jennifer Arlen, Jim Fanto, and Claire Hill. Uh, and this is entirely a four-part project. I'm just one of four, so I want to call them out for for thanks. The, the basis of our project comes out of the 1990s, 2000s, uh, and 2000s, t- 10s, uh, where we had an absolutely enormous, spectacular growth in 
fines uh, and criminal prosecutions of organizations for various uh, misconduct and misdeeds. A lot of financial organizations, but also pharmaceutical companies, exporters, all over the map. Uh, and this caused a very powerful set of uh, discussions and thinking about, well, what is the way to uh, both enforce the law against organizations' misconduct, but also uh, to encourage organizations to enforce the law on themselves through the process of co compliance. So we, uh, as we get into this, so uh, we saw that there was basically a challenge with the role of lawyers because Lawyers are very involved in this process, but not always in a strictly legal role. They play a role that's uh, more uh, holistic and involves non-legal as well as legal uh, aspects. So it challenges the basic idea of what it means to be a lawyer. There's also three new professions that have grown up. One is the profession of internal compliance, one is risk management, and one is internal audit, which had been around, but is unprofessionalized. So we've seen the growth of three new uh, professions. Uh, and there's also a very significant international dimension to uh, uh, these events because uh, the discipline of compliance and certain enforcement strategies, the criminal enforcement against really grew in the United States, but is spread worldwide. So our project tries to offer some thoughts and best practices that could be adapted not only in the United States, but also around the world. That's fascinating. Um, Christiane, speaking of international connections, I know your, your project has some interesting international components. What can you tell us? Yes, yeah, thank you so much, Larissa. Uh, indeed, I'm co-reporter on the Principles for a Data Economy project. And very much like Jeffrey, this is, like Jeffrey's project, this is a principles project. Uh, but it is a special project also in, uh, another, under another perspective. It is a joint project of the American Law Institute and the European Law Institute. So uh, we have a reporter from the ALI side, uh, which is Neil Cohen, and uh, a reporter from the ELI side, which is myself. And we also have two wonderful chairs, which is Steve Weiser from the ALI side and Lord John Thomas um, from the UK, is the former uh, Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales from the ELI side. So uh, this is a joint project and uh, I'm very happy that we embarked on this project. Both institutions came together in 2016, 2017 indeed to discuss what would be a promising project to take forward as a joint endeavor. And our choice soon fell on the data economy. So the data economy is of growing importance. I don't have to explain that. There is a lot of uncertainty worldwide about how to address those phenomena of the data economy in legal terms. Uh, with the emergence of the data economy, we have to um, decide how to apply the doctrines and the rules that have emerged over the centuries. So data cannot readily be classified as goods or rights, and they're arguably not services. They're simply data. And the, the uncertainty which we see worldwide indeed as to the applicable rules and doctrines uh, is beginning to trouble stakeholders such as data-driven industries, smaller companies, consumers. And this uncertainty undermines the predictability which is necessary for efficient transactions in data. It may inhibit innovation and growth and may also lead to market failure and to manifest unfairness in certain relationships. It became soon quite clear that there's such a vast array of legal issues to be addressed that we better focus for the time being on two big um, questions, two big legal issues, which is um, data transactions on one hand and data rights on the other. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really struck by your project, Christiane, and the fact that that the facts on the ground are changing constantly throughout the course of the project, which I think presents interesting challenges. Um, I'm going to turn now to Ken, whose project is more similar to uh, my own in defamation in the sense that he's dealing with intentional torts that have certain aspects that have uh, been around since the Middle Ages. And so, uh, Ken, tell us about your project and the challenges it presents. 
Thank you, uh, Larissa. Yes, I'm chief reporter of the restatement third of torts uh, project called Intentional Torts to Persons. This is part of an ongoing restatement third of torts project uh, that began with the products liability uh, restatement in the late 1990s and followed by the apportionment restatement. Uh, and uh, recently the decision was made to comprehensively restate all of the intentional, uh, actually all of the torts and the restatement second of torts. Uh, we are dealing with a subcategory of uh, intentional torts. Uh, uh, so we, we're not covering all intentional torts such as defamation or privacy or economic harm. We are focusing on the traditional torts of battery, assault, false imprisonment, and also a, a somewhat newly named tort called purposeful infliction of bodily harm. Uh, our project also covers transferred intent. It, it, co it covers different types of consent that preclude liability. We spent quite a bit of time trying to identify the most useful way for courts to analyze uh, when consent exists or does not exist. Uh, we have also spent a lot of time on different defenses, uh, including self-defense, defense of property, and citizen's arrest. And then we also have uh, materials on some other issues, including, for example, com comparative responsibility. Although the apportionment res uh, uh, restatement did address that to some extent, it didn't address situations which a plaintiff, for example, is reckless or intentional, uh, and it didn't uh, say much uh, about how to compare the fault of plaintiffs and defendants when they're not both simply negligent, but one is much more culpable than the other. Uh, so we've spent some time on that as well. And we're gonna turn now to Matthew and Matthew's uh, project is fascinating. Matthew, can you describe that for us? Absolutely, thank you very much. So the project I work on is the restatement of the law of American Indians. And I work on that with my lovely wife, Winona Single and uh, Kane Smith. And um, those are my wonderful partners in all of this crime that we commit on the American Law Institute. So our project overall is really is about federal Indian law. So federal Indian law is the relationship between the United States, Indian tribes and state governments. So our first three chapters are sort of the big picture chapters about federal, tribal, and state powers and prerogatives in the context of federal Indian law. And so we, um, a lot of these principles have been around since the founding of the United States and uh, really the beginning of the constitutional era in 1789, but they uh, are not necessarily well known. And so, we start with, in chapter one, a discussion of federal plenary power and all of the obligations the federal government has toward Indian people and Indian tribes. And then we move on to the inherent powers of Indian tribes that federal law acknowledges. And then we move on to the state powers and the interaction primarily between states and local governments and tribes and tribal citizens. We also have chapters that uh, came about while we're in the middle of this project, off and on, and uh, we have a chapter, chapter four, which was uh, is about uh, tribal economic activity, both as uh, tribes as economic actors and as economic regulators. We also have a chapter, chapter five, on Indian country criminal jurisdiction, which is an exceptionally hot topic, as it has been since since before there was a United States. And finally, we have a chapter on uh, effectively native natural resources, which includes a lot of things about treaty rights, water law, hunting and fishing, and who owns the resources and the property on the reservation. So I, I'm curious, Matthew, I have a follow-up question for you is, um, you're describing a law that has lots of different strands, uh, part of its common law, part of its statutes, part of its treaties, part of its constitutional. So in a restatement project, and this is something I'm, I'm struggling with as we start our project, is how do you pull those strands together into a restatement? Well, um, I'll tell you that it was no mean feat. Uh, part of it is when I came into this project, 
I described Indian law as common law, and I was quickly disabused of that notion. There is an enormous number of amount of statutory treaty law, even regulatory law that is critically important. And I think that our project, which is a, you know, going into its 10th year, it had to grow up alongside the ALI in those contexts. Um, when we would have meetings, we would be questioned on some of the choices we made, particularly when a section was about a statute, right? So if it's the black letter law, then is the statute is the black letter law, if it is controlling and unambiguous. And so what the ALI was doing at this time in other projects, uh, copyright, for example, was uh, identifying statutes that were, uh, where there was what they called substantial judicial discretion. And so there would be uh, cases interpreting a statute. And we've within Indian law, we've had that all along. So mm -hmm. we've got, um, you know, the black letter, so to speak, primarily is uh, derives from the statutes and treaties. It is about default interpretive rules, such as the canons of construing Indian treaties and Indian affairs statutes, and also what we call the clear expression rules, which are, uh, again, default interpretive rules about, the, about tribal powers primarily. And uh, that's, you know, that was sort of our guiding principle as we get into, you know, we have subchapters on things like the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act and the Indian Child Welfare Act, which seems like what is there to restate? This is a statute that uh, that delineates everything in this area. And the reality is within that statute, there are lots of, uh, there's lots of um, statutes, contested interpretations. And uh, there's a lot of work, work to, to move around in that. Um, Ken? I, so I have a question for you as a longtime torts professor. Um, why was it time to update the restatement of intentional torts, given that sometimes it seems like, you know, not much changes in battery law? Uh, well, good question. And uh, the boring answer is uh, the ALI made the decision a few years ago that instead of just having separate uh, chapters uh, or a set, a separate uh, 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 segments of the restatement third of torts, such as products, liability, and apportionment, it would be wiser to restate all of the restatement second and update it all. Uh, but the more interesting answer is that um, there have been some significant developments since the restatement second was completed in the 1970s. For example, in the law of battery, there has been controversy about what type of, is in, of intent is required for battery. The many, most jurisdictions adopt what's called single intent, that it is sufficient that the defendant intended to physically touch or contact the plaintiff. Some juris, a significant number of jurisdictions require more than that. They require dual intent. They also require not only the intent to contact, but also the intent to harm or to offend. So we wanted to look into the number of courts taking each position, but also the policy and principled reasons for taking one view rather than the other. We ended up in this particular context, endorsing the single intent view. We think it makes much more sense of existing law. For example, medical battery uh, is a recognized concept. If a doctor or nurse goes beyond the scope of consent, that counts as a battery, even though uh, there's almost never an intent to harm or offend on the part of the medical practitioners. Uh, also, in the area of sexual uh, conduct, uh, there have been a lot more cases. That's something we also wanted to restate. And um, uh, uh, in that context, actually, that also shows the value of distinguishing single from dual intent. Under a dual intent view, uh, uh, if a man uh, suddenly kisses a stranger uh, and uh, argues he hasn't committed a battery because he didn't to intend to harm or offend the stranger, he might have a plausible case uh, under a dual intent standard that he's not liable. Under single intent, it, it is clear and it should be clear that that's non-consensual. It's a physical touching without the consent of the, of the plaintiff. So that's just one of several examples where the law has evolved and changed and it's important for us to 
be on top of where the law is and where it's going. I have to say, I'm, I'm relieved you've gone with single intent. I always call that the well-meaning lout hypothetical where the, the person goes up and kisses somebody with no, they think they're a Lothario and go up and, and inflict uh, unwanted uh, conduct of that type. Uh, so I'm glad to hear you've gone with single intent. Uh, uh, Jeff, yours is a principles project. Uh, so who is it that is your target audience for this project? And how do you hope it ends up being used and how can it be useful? Those are very good questions that we've uh, dealt with uh, over the course of the project. The pro our project is unusual in two ways. One is that we deal with a topic that is partly legal, but partly non-legal. I mentioned that internal audit and internal compliance and risk management have legal aspects and there are many lawyers practicing in those areas, but there are many non-lawyers practicing in those areas as well. So we're at a kind uh, of intermediate space where it's law and it's not law at the same time. So that relates to our audience. The second feature of our project that's a little bit unusual is that there are really two sides to the project that in a way are both quite different, but in another way, there are two sides of the same coin. So one of these is internal control, which is how organizations uh, control their own internal operations to minimize the risk of misconduct by employees or agents. The other is external control, which is how prosecutors and administrative enforcement agencies go about um, uh, policing and sanctioning organizations that commit misconduct through their agents and employees. So those uh, different aspects uh, require different treatment. So that sort of defines our audience. So one thing we want to do is reach lawyers. Uh, there is a very large uh, set of principles, standards, learning about internal control. None of it's done by lawyers, pretty much. Almost all of it is done by PwC, by consulting firms, by accounting firms. And lawyers deserve a seat at this table because what lawyers do is really nothing other than internal control. When you come right down to it, we are risk managers and control experts, but lawyers have failed to get on this uh, train. So we're trying to encourage lawyers to get on this train. So our audience is, first of all, uh, taller uh, criminal and civil defense attorneys who are very interested, obviously, in defending their clients against these very great threats of liability. <clears throat> Internal management of complex organizations who have to design compliance policies and programs uh, and also the enforcers uh, who exercise discretion about both charging, should we, what should, should we charge an organization misconduct? If we do, what should we charge? And also with uh, investigating, how, how can we appropriately investigate organizations? What, what do we do about the attorney-client privilege? And also very importantly, the sanction, how much credit should we give organizations, for example, for cooperating, for having good programs for disclosing their misconduct voluntarily. So those are our, those are our kind of audiences, which is uh, uh, prosecutors, enforcers, white collar defense counsel, and people in uh, management positions and organizations who are designing policies for internal control. Christiane, um, I, I, not everybody listening to this will know about the European Law Institute. Can you give us a brief overview of the European Law Institute and why this joint project is um, you know, novel and important? Well, thank you so much, Larissa, for asking that question. Now, in a nutshell, the European Law Institute is kind of a European counterpart to the American Law Institute. And when I say Europe, I don't mean EU, I mean Europe at large. Uh, we have fellows, um, that's how we would call our members, um, from over 60 jurisdictions, and we have lots of um, institutional members, including EU institutions, but also including international organizations, um, Supreme Courts, and uh, many other uh, important players in the legal field. 
Um, what is, of course, uh, very much different is that it's a much younger institution. The ELI was founded only in 2011, so it's going to celebrate its decennial this year. Unfortunately, online, we would have loved to have a big celebration in Vienna, where the ELI has currently its headquarters, its secretariat, but that will not be possible, so we will do that on Zoom. Um, the, the aims and the working methods and the governance structures of the ELI were greatly inspired by the aims, working methods and governance structures of the ALI. So they were pretty similar. And uh, we are extremely grateful to the colleagues from the American Law Institute. And I would like to uh, mention in particular Lance Liebman and George Berman, uh, who were incredibly helpful in setting this up. They really came to Europe. They helped us design the structures. And this was how the ELI um, came about. There are some differences when it comes to working methods and procedures, but the procedures are sufficiently similar to make uh, a joint project run quite smoothly. So the ELI also has reporters, but unlike and the ALI reporters are often supported by a wider project team that ensures diversity in terms of geographical background and professional backgrounds. The, the geographical spread is, is very important in, in, in Europe as it is in the US, but maybe even more so in Europe where you have different languages, different legal traditions, so the differences are probably um, more conspicuous in, in, in Europe. Um, we also have an advisory committee for each project and a members consultative committee. So it's more or less a members consultative group. So whether you call it committee or group is <laughs> maybe not so um, important. They have the same function. And uh, a project also needs approval from both the council and the membership. But unlike in the ALI, we do not approve or reject project results in different batches, but rather only once at the end when a project has been finalized. So um, in the ALI, we, we often come to the council and or usually come to the council and to the membership uh, with uh, several parts of our project and seek uh, uh, approval separately. And in the ELI, basically, you, you, you submit discussion drafts all the time and they're always discussed and the ELI bodies would always provide their critical input, but then uh, rejection or approval hopefully uh, would come um, uh, at the very end only. So this is maybe one conspicuous difference when it comes to our procedures. Are you expecting uh, future projects between the ALI and ELI that you know of? Well, that would be lovely. I think the experience of this project was just great. We were very hesitant at first because we thought, well, I mean, the legal traditions in Europe and in the US are very different. And even though data economy is not the same as data privacy, it's a little bit close. And there are different legal traditions and different attitudes uh, when it comes to how to deal with data. And uh, the, the experience of this joint work on the project was just amazing, I have to say. Uh, never was there a period when we felt it's difficult to communicate with each other. Yes, of course, there are different approaches in the US and in Europe, but it was always possible to find uh, a common language. And um, that is really one of the wonderful um, um, aspects of, of our joint work. So I would love to see more projects between the ALI and the ELI emerging, but let's for the time being finish this one and then yeah. let's yeah. talk about possible future collaboration. Well, I have certainly been struck by the fact that these projects are, are themselves learning experiences and you know, despite being immersed in my field for over a quarter of a century now, I've learned so much just from coming on to the project. Um, so I think I'd like to turn and ask each of you, um, I'll start with Matthew, what have you learned since starting the project that you didn't know before you started the project? Well, uh, it's a lot. So I really think that uh, my, my favorite experiences are with the judges. 
And, uh, you know, I've done case books, I've worked on treatises, and I'm aware of, you know, sort of the big treatise in Indian law is the Cohen Handbook on Federal Indian Law. And what all of those projects are missing is the participation of judges. And the judges are really quite brilliant at stopping everything when they see it going down a, a particular road and saying, you know, this is all great for whatever discussion you're having, but as a judge, I can't use this. This black letter isn't something I could ever cite to. And um, that really kept us um, constrained and cabined in a way that was extremely helpful. Um, having the judges, particularly the judges from the federal appellate bench, but several state court judges were involved as well, was a wonderful experience. And uh, I think that was, that's a huge part of it. I also learned a little bit about the work, a lot about the workings of the ALI and um, how, as I said before, they're sort of going through a transition, right? Um, not everything is about the common law anymore. You know, this is an age of statutes and regulations. So um, we, we've worked through that. And, um, and I also have delved a little bit into constitutional law. And I think that the final big thing I wanted to point out in terms of what I've learned is um, to uh, identify the areas that truly are black letter law. We are a restatement after all. And um, there are a lot of things that, that are ongoing disputes that are, you know, there may even be splits in the, the circuits uh, or, or lower court decisions, uh, things that are just contested that are, the Supreme Court has not decided to resolve. And in our area, federal Indian law, the Supreme Court and Congress really is king. So um, what we decided to do in those areas that are uncertain and um, un unrestatedable, so to speak, uh, we left them alone. We highlighted them. We pointed them out, said they're here. This is an issue. It's unresolved. We're going to leave it alone. And, um, you know, that was not an easy thing to do. You know, it was a part of us uh, as restatement, as the reporters um, and many of the advisors really wanted to um, go out on a limb in some of these things and try to get the um, ALI to, to assert a position on those questions, but we decided not to do that. Uh, we had plenty of work to do elsewhere, and uh, we chose to sort of take uh, the route of looking for the uh, low-hanging fruit, so to speak. Yeah, that's 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 fascinating, and uh, um, uh, you know, raises the question of how what do you do with controversial provisions? But let me turn now to. Um, uh, Jeff, Jeff, what have you learned and what's been controversial along the way? Well, uh, I think three things. The first is that uh, I think all of us, my report, fellow reporters and all our advisory groups and people we've talked to, uh, we've learned that compliance and enforcement is a, is a field in, and is an enormously important field. In a way, it's the uh, response of the legal system and also the business and organizational system to uh, the enormous administrative state and the spectacular increase both in the obligations that people have, organizations have, and also the uh, exposure they have both to civil liability and also to criminal liability. And it's not just organizations, it's also highly placed people in organizations who these days face significant threat of going to prison uh, if they engage in misconduct. So this is a new field, it's not yet probably never will be, but it's extremely important. It, it in some sense, resembles in its growth the, the birth of administrative law in the late 19th century. This is something new. Um, second is the difficulty of the issues because uh, we're, we're really balancing some very fundamental questions the, the protection of, uh, uh, of customers, uh, the, uh, the integrity of supply chains, the power of the government, the, the permissible authority can use the, the protections that should or ought to be given to organizations. These are all very, very difficult questions, whether there should be an affirmative defense or having an effective compliance program. These are very difficult questions of public policy and they have not been thought through uh, fully. So part of our process was to think it through. We didn't arrive at uh, solutions to even most of these questions, but uh, we did think it through and I hope that our project contributes to an ongoing debate about that. And the last thing I learned uh, to my great pleasure is that 
although there are strong differences of opinion and certainly differences of position and interests, uh, we found that there was a tremendous amount of good faith and uh, common ground, uh, both in defense counsel and prosecutors and internal control people and uh, compliance people uh, for uh, organizations other than corporations. Uh, they came to together in our process uh, and really uh, came to a common ground where I think we hope, I hope at least, we have a fair degree of consensus. So that's a, a very good uh, and, and positive outcome. Um, at least I hope a positive outcome. So that's, um, that's it. Ken, what about you? What have you learned and what's been challenging? Uh, I guess one thing I'd say I, that we've learned is um, it's, it's, it's been challenging to work in an area of tort law in which there are relatively few reported cases compared to some other areas um, for various practical reasons, including limited insurance coverage for intentional torts. And it's an area of law that's been relatively neglected by judges and scholars as compared to some other areas. So that's been both a challenge and an opportunity, an opportunity to really try to make sense of some areas of the law that haven't been thought through as clearly as they could be. And I think consent is one of those, uh, the defenses, different senses of reasonableness in terms of what counts as reasonable force, uh, we tried to, to address more, more carefully. In terms of controversy, um, one, a couple of areas that I, that I might highlight, one is the definition of offensiveness in the tort of battery. What counts as an offensive contact? And the traditional definition is objective. It is what would be offensive to a reasonable sense of dignity. But there's a caveat in the restatement second that says, well, we don't express an opinion about what happens if the defendant knows the plaintiff would find the contact offensive, even though most people would not find it offensive. We had very lengthy debates about this. Our original proposal was to extend liability in such a case um, because the defendant is at fault for going forward with physically touching a person in a way that they knew that person would find offensive, even if um, many or most people would not. The ALI was not willing to go quite that far, but uh, we ended up with a, a modified proposal, which we're, we're still happy with, which is that liability is extended if the defendant acted out, out of the very purpose of offending a person with an extra sensitivity. So for example, if there is someone with uh, autism spectrum disorder who hates being touched, and if their classmates repeatedly touch the person on the head, uh, that may not offend a reasonable sense of dignity according to some uh, juries, but uh, it is uh, the kind of uh, highly unjustifiable conduct for which we think there should be liability. One other controversial area that we're about to present at the annual meeting this May is the question of the scope of the privilege of citizen's arrest. And we've looked at the case law and the history of this. Uh, there's an extremely broad scope of citizen's arrest privilege to use even deadly force to prevent any, uh, to arrest or prevent uh, any felony. Well, the number of felonies that are recognized in uh, state criminal laws today as compared to 100 years ago uh, is enormous. There's been enormous inflation and there are genuine dangers of vigilantism and uh, escalation of violence if we authorize private citizens to arrest other citizens as we've seen from recent events. So we are proposing a significant cutting back of that privilege consistent, we think, with other tort defenses and other tort principles. Um, and we'll, we just have to wait and see at the May meeting uh, how, how controversial this turns out to be, but we think it's an important position to take and it is one consistent with more general principles in, of tort law. Well, now I know I need to attend the May meeting for sure. Um, I think we're coming to the close of our time, but I wanna leave the last word to Christiane. Uh, Christiane? Is there, is there one or two things you'd like to share with us about uh, the overall sense of what you've gotten from this experience? Well, certainly, as I already said, it was an amazing experience to be working together with Neil and Steve and John on this uh, uh, project. 
and to be uh, in a room with so many brilliant minds who really sit down and discuss matters of substance, always in a very constructive um, atmosphere. Um, uh, maybe something that was um, very, very um, rewarding uh, and that I could mention from a methodological point of view is that um, on that project, I really learned how it is possible to phrase principles that can potentially work in any kind of legal environment. And I really personally profited from the methodological rigor and the style guide of the ALI. I remember Ricky was sitting in all the meetings and telling us, don't write the party must or the party shall write the law should provide that. And he was right. And that was so helpful to have that methodological rigor. And it really helped us overcome uh, many of the difficulties that were certainly on the way, because in the data economy, as you can imagine, there many very controversial issues and um uh, may, maybe to mention just one example, uh, the, the, the principle on whether a party who had a share in the generation of data, such as the owner of a connected car that is producing lots of data, does that person have a right to require a certain share in profits made by, for example, the automobile industry with the help of that data? Now, we had advisors really emphatically urging us to create such a right. And we had then the other fraction who were urging us and fighting fiercely against any such share uh, in profit. So at the end of the day, um, we, we, we uh, presented a kind of compromise solution so that we say, okay, um, we recognize in principle that there can be such a right, but the conditions we formulated are so strict and so narrowly formulated uh, that it's really very, very rarely that you can have uh, uh, such a right um, under the principles as they currently stand. And maybe just one one last remark, something that was, of course, very special to our project is that uh, the legal issues we had to deal with were mostly quite new and under-researched. So we really had to start from scratch sometimes and to develop new concepts that had not been developed before because simply those concepts didn't exist, such as the, the, the concept of rights and co-generated data. And as the concepts we developed sounded unfamiliar to the audiences on both sides of the Atlantic, um, often each audience suspected that the concept, because it sounded unfamiliar uh, to them, must have been copied from the other system, which was usually not at all the case. So, for instance, in that principle, which I just uh, mentioned about the share in profits that were derived with the help of data, we received many remarks from U.S. colleagues uh, who suspected that we copied this principle from the GDPR or from European law. But the GDPR or European law are very hostile towards that idea, so they do not at all um, uh, uh, suggest such a, a claim. So uh, we always had to convince each side of the Atlantic, you know, oh, no, this is really something we created. Uh, it's not our project in order to have neutral terminology, in order to have neutral concepts that can really work uh, uh, in, in whatever legal environment you have. And that was really maybe um, uh, uh, something um, but, well, that was entirely new for me. Well, I, I just want to conclude by saying that for me, one of the, the greatest gifts of the ALI so far is that it's enabled me to uh, get to know some of the most brilliant legal minds uh, in this country and as, as we see internationally as well. And so I'm so glad to be here with you all today. And I wish you well on your projects and I appreciate the chance to learn from your experiences. Thank you for tuning into Reasonably Speaking. Visit ALI.org to learn about this important topic and our speakers. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Reasonably Speaking is produced by the American Law Institute with audio engineering by Kathleen Morton, digital editing by Sarah Ferrero, and I'm Graham Lucas.